We're in week five of a study through the book of Judges. I, I hope you found this to be interesting. Um, it, it's, been, it's been fun for me. I've never actually taught through the book of Judges. I've taught on some of the characters at different times before, but this is the first time I did a, like a sermon series on Judges. And, and um, so we were titling it. I, I was trying to figure out, what, what do we call this thing? You know, I, knew, I knew there'd be this vicious cycle. You know, then we'd be talking about these cycles uh, throughout it, and, and, and we'll kind of touch on that again just to keep that thread going through the whole thing. But uh, I called it Surviving Culture. And I did that because we, we kind of have this double-edged sword, this double challenge that we all have, right? I mean, I have my own stuff, my own temptations, my own evil desires that I'm, that I'm battling against. I want to live like Jesus. I wanna, if this says do it, I want to do it. If this says don't do it, I don't want to do it, right? Uh, but sometimes I battle that because the, 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 my flesh wants to do some of the, the stuff this says don't do, right? And, and so, so that's one part of the battle. Uh, but, but we also live in a world full of people just like me. And just like you, who, who, who uh, have evil desires and have temptations, and, and not everyone is committed to live by this book. You know? Not everyone even makes it a battle. They just say, hey, let's just do this because it seems right. right? So, so not only am I battling my stuff, but I'm living in a world where people may or may not be battling their stuff. So as culture as large kind of moves in different directions at different times, do, doing, doing stuff, and, and that can't help but rub up off on us a little bit. So, like, we want to survive culture. <laughs> we want to survive whatever culture is doing. We want to kind of ignore that and just, just kind of keep this as our standard. Let's just keep doing what this says to do and not doing what this says not to do. And, and, and it's really, really simple, except that we have these outside influences. Um, in, in the 70s, whenever that was, uh, the big, one of the popular, you know, sins of preaching was don't, don't drink alcohol. Everybody stay away from alcohol. So I, I was raised in a church where we were told, don't drink at all, don't drink at all. And so sometime early in my years, uh, grade school years, I, I made the commitment, I'm just never going to drink. Okay? I'm just, just not going to, just not going to happen. And I, and I was really solid on that in fifth grade and sixth grade and <laughs> seventh grade. <laughs> and, and it was around the house, right? It was, you know, but, but it just... I just didn't. I didn't care. Matter of fact, I, I would like almost kind of cringe because I knew where the. I would like look at. I knew where it was. Like, Ugh, you know, evil Satan lives there. You know, and, and so I just stayed away from it. And and, uh, and I went through junior high when all my my friends were trying it. And I'd be like, nope, not doing it. You know, went through high school. All the friends are, are you know, by then they're not trying it. There's you know in it right. And I'm like, nope, didn't do it. Well, somewhere along the line, I started dating a gal. We dated for three and a half years. She she did not have the same uh, decision commitment that I had made. And uh, so, so she, she enjoyed it and, and um, engaged in it thoroughly. And uh, for th like two and a half years or so, I, I was like, whatever, you do your thing, I'll do my thing. You know, I, I got a Jesus thing going on. You know, I, I, had, that, I had that commitment um, to not do it. But, but um, in a three and a half year commitment that lasted two and a half years, right? So, so somewhere along the line, I started observing, this is the surviving culture thing. I started observing, hey, I got a bunch of buddies that do this. And, um, and, and I knew biblically, like the Bible doesn't say don't drink. You know, it says don't get drunk. I mean, I know all the scriptural stuff, right? So it wasn't like a, a debate on that. Um, I just had decided I was going to go beyond that. And, but anyway, I, I looked at, at her life and my friend's life, and no one had been struck down by lightning yet. I thought, hmm, that's weird. They've consumed an awful lot, and no one has died yet from lightning, anyway. Um, and uh, the plague hadn't spread through, uh, you know, my friends. Anyway, I started looking at culture going, well, maybe it's not that big of a deal, right? So in, in my heart, in my commitment I had made, there started to be some, some, some compromise of, well, maybe it's not, you know, that big of a deal. And so then I, I decided, well, I should, if, by the way, if I'm going to be a pastor, I should be able to know what people, I should relate to people, right? I, th this was actually part of the justification in my head. I should know their struggles, and, and if I've never had a drink, how could I say, just stop it, you know, unless I've, so, so, I, so I engaged, and, um, and uh, engaged heavily. Um, uh, and I thought, hey, this is, this is uh, I hadn't been struck by lightning yet. And uh, for those of you who know me for a long time, I've been through a six-month period of, of like really engaging to the point where I started doing foolish things and, and um, started, started even changing my life course. Uh, I, in fourth grade, I felt a, a distinct call to, to be a pastor, to, to teach scripture, to, to be a Bible guy. And now I was going, you know, the post office is a good job. And it is. My dad was a post office guy, so I'm, I'm, that's not, I mean, that, that, I'll do what my dad did, right? Um, and, and I actually filled out an application. 
um, and was considering dropping out of college, because I was breaking the rules anyway, you weren't supposed to drink in my college. And, and, um, and I just started making decisions. I knew that my girlfriend at that point uh, would, you should probably believe in Jesus, right, if you're going to, like, be the pastor's wife and, and stuff. Um, anyway, I'm going too far there. Um, uh, she believed uh, she would not make a good pastor's wife. <laughs> and she knew that, and I knew that. Um, but I, I, I was thinking, well, I'll just go this direction anyway. This seems to be the direction I should go. And, and, and long story short, I'll just keep going if I don't just end this. I mean, it, it came to a point where I had to decide what direction am I really going in life. I had to survive my surroundings, besides survive myself. And, 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 I, and I cut it off. And said, "Okay, I'm going. I'm, I could go back to what I was doing, and I and I, I didn't touch it for at least 20, 30, 20 years. I don't know how how long. And, and then I thought, okay, I can trust myself now. And then I know the scriptural stuff. This isn't the message about drinking. It's, it's just I realized. I mean, it's it's, it's anyway. Yeah, uh, <laughs> I'm chasing a different 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 uh, rabbit down there. Um, the fact is, I had to make a decision. I'm like, am I going to follow where I really believe God wants me to go, or am I going to do what what seems fun?" to me at the time. And, and, and uh, so I, I, I cut off, that sounds bad, I cut off all the fun <laughs> to follow Jesus. Uh, but the, you know what I'm saying, I had to choose what, what path I, I was going. Now, that's kind of a microcosm, I didn't explain it very well, of, of um, what I think we've seen going on in Israel over and over through the book of, of Judges. People are watching what's going on around them, and they're saying, well, I don't know, I mean, so there's some Asherah worship going on. There's a Baal worship going on there. I mean, nobody seems to be dying from it. They seem to be doing okay. And, and, and my neighbor, he's doing it now too. And they got an Asherah pole and they got a Baal idol. And, and I mean, uh, it doesn't seem to be that big of a deal. And, and it started spreading. And pretty soon, not only were they not surviving their own evil desires, they weren't surviving culture. It was having an influence on them. The Canaanite culture was having an influence on the Israelite culture until the whole point, the whole thing flipped, and it was only the Canaanite culture. That's happened multiple times in, in the book of Judges. Now, in, in our study, and here's the thread, I'm going to tie it all together before we get to our judge of the day. We've looked at two cycles that tend to happen, and I've struggled with this, and you've struggled with this. We're all human beings. We, we go through this, and we have definitely seen this in the book of Judges. The first one is a cycle of sin, where people start with freedom. The land was at rest. Everything was great. People were good with God as a nation. You're, you're at rest. You're at peace with God. You have a great relationship with him. Everything's wonderful. Then you compromise. I don't know, maybe it's not that big of a deal. Whatever it is, you start compromising, which leads to sin, which leads to bondage, and some type of pain involved with that. The people would be overtaken by another nation when it came to Israel as a nation. That could last for a year. It could last 18 years, like we're going to look at today. Uh, But at some point, repentance would come, and then it'd go back to freedom again. And this is this continual cycle. keeps going and going and going and going. You've lived it. I've lived it. The nation has lived it. Uh, It's just what it is. This also intersects with this generational cycle that we've talked about and we've seen in Judges and, and we're living in today because we, we're alive in a culture today. But So we can see this in America, but we definitely see this in Judges uh, as a couple step, steps back where we're looking at a people who have lived you know, over a course of, what we say, this is two, three hundred years or so in, in Judges. Generation one experiences God. Whether it's they came out of Egypt and they experienced that, or whether it's one of the judges who brought them back to repentance, they, they, they saw God work. They saw God do some amazing things in their lives. They personally repented. They personally said, I am on with God. They understood him to be uh, the God above all gods, that he is a jealous God, that there is no God but him. That's generation one. They have children who grow up, and they're living around the Canaanites now in this situation. Uh, they don't have the personal experience of, of major change in repentance that their parents had. Uh, they, they, they understand God. They think God's cool. They like God. But they got buddies who are doing the Baal worship and the Asherah worship, uh, and, and they're thinking, well, why not just do both? So it diminishes a little bit to generation two. Generation three, those people have children, and they grow up. So within the third generation, they grow up. They compare the worship of God to that, to the worship of Baal and the Asherah poles and, and, and everything that happened with that. And they're thinking, man, Baal and Asherah sound way more fun than God. You know, why, why, don't, why, why are we wasting our time with Jehovah when we have these other cool gods that, that, we, can, that we can follow? And if you, were, you missed last week, um, last week has a lot more detail on what that is talking about, what those gods look like, what, they, what their worship was about. Uh, much of it is centered around sexual activity with uh, multiple people and 
and, and multiple times and, and, and sacrificing children. And, and there, there, was, there, was, there was incredible stuff that happened with that. And so they would look at this and say, man, why don't we do this instead? So by the third generation, you have, like in Judges 2, this happens multiple times, uh, there was another generation that rose uh, that did not know the Lord. They don't even know the stories, right? They just, they just don't even know God. Which leads us to Judges 10. gets us caught up to where we are today. And I want to stay up front. I, I wish there was a way I could, in good conscience, skip this one. I don't like this story. I mean, I just don't like it. Uh, we'll let it speak for itself. Judges 10. The people of Israel, again, did what was evil in the sight of the Lord and served the Baals and the Asherah. I mean, really? We just figured this out, right? We just figured out that's a bad idea. Well, now, here they're at it again. They followed but the gods of Syria, the gods of Sidon, the gods of Moab, the gods of Ammonites, the gods of the Philistines. They forsook the Lord did not serve him. So the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel. He sold them into the hand of the Philistines, into the hand of the Amorites. They crushed and oppressed the people of Israel that year. For 18 years, they oppressed all the people of Israel who were beyond the Jordan, the land of Ammonites, which is Gilead. And the Ammonites crossed the Jordan to fight also against Judah, against Benjamin, against the house of Ephraim, so that Israel was severely distressed. There's that cycle. They compromised somewhere along the line. They began sinning. They, they went full into rebellion against God. And now there's pain entering into the picture. God has said, okay, we'll put you into bondage if that's what you're looking for. And once again, after 18 years, so, so we're talking about a pretty good generation now has raised up the, to, you know, in the process of becoming adults now. Uh, the people cry out to God going, wait a minute, this is a bad idea. We made some poor choices. And, and, and look at God's response this time. This, this was fascinating to me. God's response this time, uh, you Get the idea that God, he's like growing tired of their flippant view of sin. Of their, let's just do what we want, we can always ask God to forgive us later thing. Okay, Because his response is very different than what we've seen in Judges so far. They had this season of doing whatever they wanted to do. And verse 10 says, And the people of Israel cried out to the Lord, saying, We have sinned against you. So, so on one hand... This is the first time they're really repenting, it seems like, in the beginning. Before, it was just like, we don't like what's happening. God, save us. And then like, repentance comes with it. This time, they're like, whoa, we're doing wrong. So their heart is, is starting out right here, from what it appears to us. We've sinned against you because we have forsaken our God. We've served the Baals. And the Lord said to the people of Israel, uh, excuse me? Did I not save you from the Egyptians and the Amorites? from the Ammonites, from the Philistines, the Sidonians, also the Amalekites and the Mo Moites. I pressed you and you cried out to me and I, and I saved you out of their hand, yet you have forsaken me and served other gods. Therefore, I will save you no more. Go and cry out to the gods whom you have chosen. Let them save you in your time of distress. Ouch. Ouch. I, I uh, love the grace of God because it's just not deserved. <laughs> That's the whole point of grace, right? I don't deserve it. Um, I love the grace of God. I cling to scriptures that promise his grace and his forgiveness uh, toward us. I, I, mean, I fully depend on those scriptures because I, I do go through that cycle like you do, you know, and sometimes I go through the same cycle, the same stuff. And I'm like, okay, God, I did that again. Man, I'm so sorry. You know, and I don't want to be these guys. I don't want to be Israel. I don't want to ever have God say, really? I mean, seriously? Again? Right? You think I haven't noticed this pattern? You think I haven't noticed that same cycle over and over again? You compromise, you sin, they punish you, you call out for help, I save you. That's what, he was really, that's what he's saying to Israel here. You sin, I punish you, I call you out for help, I save you. <laughs> I, uh, I went to a preaching conference this, this past week, a uh, preaching and teaching conference where a bunch of preachers preached, right? And um, one of the guys was uh, a guy named Drew Sherman from Texas. I, I'd never heard him speak before, I wasn't sure who he was, but he had a, a, a kind of a neat story that... Uh, yes. uh, I don't know if I got all the details because I wasn't like taking notes on it or anything, but it was, he, he, was, he, he, he was saying, you know what, he, he kind of needs to lose a little weight. And I'm thinking, yeah, right. And, and um, they had an event at their house and, and there was a bunch of 
people that were over, and his wife had made these delicious cookies, right? I mean, like wonderful cookies. Like he said, he kind of really went into the deliciousness of these cookies. And everybody left, and there's probably a couple dozen cookies left. And there, he's like, well, what are we going to do with those cookies? He's like, well, what do you think we should do? And he goes, well, I'll have one. You know? so, so he takes a cookie. And she puts the rest in a, in a Ziploc bag and closes it up. And uh, she's at the um, island in their kitchen. And she opens up the cover and throws it in the garbage under the sink. And he's like, uh, <laughs> what, are you, what are you doing there? <laughs> what are you doing there, young lady? And, and she, he's like, uh, he goes, you don't need these cookies. He goes, I know. I could take them to to work tomorrow, to, to, to church, to staff. The staff would love these cookies. She goes, I don't trust you. You'll eat half of them before you get there. And he's like, that's beside the point. <laughs> you know, uh, the, the, that, that's a waste. That's terrible. She goes, ah, too late. They're in the garbage. So they go to bed, and he's kind of disturbed. Like, you know, man, that's terrible. He wakes up the next morning. He's got, a, got his Bible in one hand, his coffee, and he's ready to do some devotions. And he thinks, man, those cookies are right in that. I mean, I know, I know right where they are. They're in a Ziploc bag, right? It says stay fresh right on it. I mean, um, <laughs> So he digs through, because there's been other stuff thrown on top of it by then, digs through, he opens up the bag, takes out three cookies, and, and he's sitting down reading his Bible, and his wife wakes up and comes in. She's like, what? What are you doing? No, but they're good. You know, uh, they go through that whole thing. He goes off and, and, and has a day of work, and, and it, it's, it's garbage day. He lives in Texas, where it gets pretty warm, and she throws him out at the curb, you know, where the big, large containers are, and he has a rough day, and he's coming back home. He's driving the, 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 uh, the driveway, and he looks over that container, and he's thinking, those are warm cookies. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I don't remember if he ate them or not. <laughs> but, but here was his, his question. Why do we keep going back to the garbage when God has so much better for us? You know, why do we, why do we go and dig around the garbage when he's got the best stuff right there for us. Why, why dig around Baal worship? Why dig around the Asherah pool? Why, you know, all the, all, or the stuff that we do. Why, why do we run to that when God is right there? And I'm like, oh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. See, I don't, I don't want to be that guy. I don't want to be the guy roaming around digging through the garbage when God has so much better for us. But sometimes I do. Not, not literally for cookies, but sometimes I do. And Israel was, was there right here, right now. But this time they seem to get it. This time they seem to be like, okay, uh, we're in the garbage. We're going to close the container and seal it up. We're done with the garbage. The people, verse 15 says, of Israel said to the Lord, we have sinned. Right? We're, we're, we're going to stop this. Do to us whatever seems good to you. Only please deliver us this day. So they put away the foreign gods from among them. And they served the Lord, and he became impatient over the misery of Israel. This may be the first time in Judges I'm like, I'm impressed, actually, with Israel. They're like, you did this right. Uh, yes, you messed up. Yes, you sinned. Yes you, yes, you were digging in the garbage. But they're like, I'm, no, we're really sorry. And they repented. That's what repentance means. They, they took down the idols themselves. They didn't have to have somebody else come and, 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 and do it for them. They did it. They cleaned them up. They went back to God. And then God said, man, I really don't like my people suffering like this. Let's, 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 let's take care of them. So, so, so even God's heart changed in this whole thing. He was like really tired of messing with them. And he's like, no, I still love you guys. Let's, let, let's, let's, let's clean this up. Let, let, let's do this. So verse 17, uh, we got a conflict coming up. The Ammonites are called to arms. They encamp at Gilead. The people of Israel come together. They encamp at Mizpah. And the people, of, of, uh, the people, the leaders of Gilead, said to one another, who's the man who will begin to fight against the Ammonites? Uh, he shall be head over all the inhabitants of, of Gilead. So, all right, so it's, it's time for a new leader. We need a new judge to rise up. We need someone else like the other judges who are going to go to war for us and lead us and, and get us back to victory, back to freedom, where we want to be. Introduce Jephthah. Jephthah was a Gileadite, a mighty warrior, but he was the son of a prostitute. Gilead was the father of Jephthah, and Gilead's wife also bore him sons, and when his wife's sons grew up, they drove Jephthah out and said to him, You shall not have an inheritance in our father's house, for you are the son of another woman. Then Jephthah fled from his brothers and lived in the land of Tob, and worthless fellows collected around Jephthah and went out with him. So, so Jephthah's family is fairly typical. We know where Asherah worship was going on, Baal worship was going on, part of 
uh, the Asherah and the Baal was you, you would go around the pole. If you're wanting to have uh, a healthy produce in your farm, you're going to find yourself a, a prostitute. You're going to act out what you want the gods to do. So you have some sexual activity out there by the pole. The gods look at you and say, hey, we should do that too. So they do that. And that somehow brings blessing upon your farm. So that's what was going on. Jephthah is a result of dad and a prostitute being together. And, and the brothers are like, okay, uh, you're not one of us, so get out once they all grow up. We don't want you getting our inheritance. This, this, this is our land, right? This isn't yours. So they, they push him out. And now he's out causing all kinds of trouble, leading a band of troublemakers. But the leaders now want a leader. They want a fighter. They want a scrapper. They want someone who can lead the army. Who's going to do that but a fighter, but a warrior? Happens to be Gilead. Jephthah, <laughs> my mind just went somewhere, uh, and, and he's a leader, and, and he's a fighter, and so they get him, he agrees to do it, and he's like, okay, here's the deal, if I do this and I win, I'm the leader, yep, you're the leader, okay, they, they sign the contract, great, and then he does something, this is the part I hate, I don't get it, so, I'm so, I, I've been trying to process this for 30 years, don't get it, they don't get it. Chapter 11 of Judges, verse 29, the spirit of the Lord was upon Jephthah, so, so God's working through him. He's raised him as a, as a judge, right? He passes through Gilead and Manasseh, and he passed on to Zippah of Gilead, and from Mizpah of Gilead, he passed on to the Ammonites. So he's winning, he's winning, he's winning, he's gaining land. And Jephthah made a vow to the Lord. Why? Things are already going well. <laughs> Why? Why? Jephthah made a vow to the Lord and said, If you will give me the Ammonites into my hand, then whatever comes out from the doors of my house to meet me when I return in peace from the Ammonites shall be the Lord's. I will offer it up for a burnt offering. Now, isn't that an odd vow? I mean, yeah. Uh, I can't imagine what might come out of my house when I've been out to war for a while and I come back the victor. Maybe a chicken, you know? Uh, I, I, I mean, it could have been. I mean, <laughs> but I, I, really? Is that really what's going to come out first? Dad's home. How about your daughter? <laughs> right? Well, that's what happened. So Jephthah crossed over, verse 32, uh, to the Ammonites to fight against them. The Lord gave them into his hand. So God did his part, right? He struck them from Aor to the neighborhood of Maninth and the 20. 20 cities as far as Abel Karim with a great blow. So the Ammonites were subdued before the people of Israel. Victory came. God was already with them. He didn't really need to make the vow, but he made the vow. So now what's he going to do? Verse 34 And Jephthah came to his home in Mizpah. Behold, his daughter came out to meet him with tambourines with dances. Oh, dad's home. Yay. Hi, princess. Yeah. She was his only child. <coughs> Besides her, he had neither son nor daughter, and as soon as he saw her, he tore his clothes and said, Alas, my daughter, you brought me very low. You've become the cause of great trouble for me, for I have opened my mouth to the Lord, and I cannot take back my vow. Uh, excuse me, uh, Jephthah, you <laughs> caused trouble. Your daughter didn't. You're the one who opened your mouth, right? I have opened my mouth to the Lord, I cannot break my vow. She said to him, My father, you have opened your mouth to the Lord, do to me according to to what has gone out of your mouth, now that the Lord has avenged you on your enemies, the Ammonites. I, I, I haven't even struggled there. I'm, I'm sure, oh, by the way, uh, Danielle, <laughs> my daughter, uh, I told God I'd kill you if uh, whatever happened. Okay. All right, but that's what she says. So she says to her father, let this thing be done for me. Leave me alone for two months that I may go up and down on the mountains and weep for my virginity, I and my companions. So he said, go, and he sent her away for two months, and she departed, she and her companions. She wept for her virginity to the mountains, and at the end of two months, she returned to her father, who did with her according to his vow that he had made. Is that disturbing to anybody? That's the most disturbing story to me uh, in, in Scripture. And... and um, uh, uh, yeah, so I came up with three lessons. We've been trying to do lessons on, on uh, these um, judges, and, and the first one's really obvious, I think. Uh, rash promises are a really bad idea, right? Can you agree with me on that? I mean, what? What were you thinking? What were you thinking, Mr. Jephthah? Don't, don't make promises you, you don't want to keep. Uh, so your, your car is broken down on the side of the road, and you're, and, and you're hoping to get out, and you're thinking, okay, God, I'll, just, I'll be a missionary, you know, if you get me out of this mess. Uh, maybe you shouldn't make that vow unless you plan to be a missionary. 
Anybody ever make that one before? Don't, don't raise your hand. Huh? <laughs> <I don't. laughs> uh, um, uh, Lord, uh, if, you, if you do this thing for me, you know, whatever it is, uh, I'll sell everything I have and give half to the poor, whatever, kind of a Zacchaeus thing, you know. Uh, don't, don't, don't promise to be faithful and, and honor your spouse unless you plan to be faithful and, and honor your, your spouse. You know? uh, he, he, now, that's a good vow, by the way. But just don't do it lightly. Don't make rash ones. Don't, don't make those spur of the moment. Oh, I, just, I just need help real quick. Ah, oh, God, I'll do whatever. You know, uh, no, 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 no. Jesus said it pretty well. Let your yes be yes, your no be no. Just kind of let it do that happen, right? right? Don't, don't have to do these crazy vow things. And, and so I really struggle with this because Jephthah made a really bad vow and then he kept it. And, and I don't even have time to unpack this whole thing. Like, was it part of the shame thing of the culture that it was actually worse for shame on the family to make a vow and not, not fulfill it than it was to actually take your only child and and burn them on an altar. I mean, they were used to child sacrifice, although she's an adult at this point. Um, you know, there's, there's so many things that honestly, uh, you know, c- confuse me and have never been settled with, with, with this story. Um, but that's the lesson. The lesson is for us, don't make any crazy vows. Don't make any crazy, crazy, crazy promises that, that you have no intention of keeping. Number two, there's, a re- there's no reason to doubt God will do what he says he'll do. Okay, God's already working with them. God's already blessing them. God, God's already in, in the midst of, of this whole battle thing going on. He didn't need to make that vow. So, so if, he, if he said he's going to do it, j- just trust him. Has God ever let you down? I mean, you may have been disappointed. You may not have understood the whole picture, but he's, has he ever let you down in life? No. No, 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 he hasn't. You know what? If, if God says you're forgiven, Trust him. You're forgiven. That's that grace thing. Uh, you know, sometimes people struggle. I don't know if I'm really forgiven. Did he say you're forgiven? Yeah. So you're forgiven, all right? Trust him. Trust him. There's no reason to doubt God will do what he says he, he, will, he will do. Uh, he says you're going to go to heaven. You're going to go to heaven, all right? You put your faith in Jesus Christ. You're living a Jesus life. You're, you're going to heaven, you, you, you know? Don't doubt that. Don't be scared about that. Don't, don't, don't wonder about, about, about that. You're going through tough times. God says he'll walk with you. It means he's going to walk with you. Now, you may not see him all the time or feel him all the time or understand or know what's going on, but he's there. He's there. He is always faithful. He never lies. He never misleads. He means what he says. He says what he means always, every single time. You read it in here. It's true. It's just true. Okay? Don't doubt it. Don't, don't be afraid. Don't, don't, don't wonder. Oh, maybe not now. Maybe it's changed. It hasn't changed. He, he is. He is who he is. All right. So, so, so trust him. And here's, here's the third lesson. And, I, and this is my favorite part of the story. God can use you no matter what your past. I mean, Israel was pretty messed up. We, we've seen it multiple times now in, in uh, the, the, the story of, of Judges. And they're at this stage pretty messed up. And a messed up family gives birth to a messed up child in the midst of, we assume, the sheer worship that was going on. As an adult... Jephthah was uh, pretty messed up. He seemed to attract messed up people to hang out with him. And they probably did a lot of messed up things, uh, enough that the leaders thought, hey, let's go talk to Jephthah. We know he's a warrior. How do you know he's a good warrior? Well, because he's going out doing messed up stuff. They, they, They know he's skilled there. Even when being used by God and the Spirit of God is on him and he's doing these, leading the, the army in battle, he makes up a messed up vow, and then he kept that vow, which I think is messed up too. You know, th- there's not a lot of positive things to say about Jephthah. <laughs> but Jephthah was used by God. And he was a judge. He's actually mentioned in Hebrews 11 as a man of faith that brought the people out of the torment that they, they were in. That tells me Whatever you've done, wherever's been part of your life, whatever, you, whatever, God can use you. I find that encouraging. I find that encouraging. Wherever you've walked, he can use you. He can use you to influence people where you work. He can uh, bring your family to faith in Christ through you. He can use you to teach his children, to lead his small groups, to reach your neighbors, we got a group of messed up people going to Zimbabwe in a few months. 
Most of them are messed up. You can decide who. And we're going to talk to some people there. And he'll be able to use us. Because his grace covers all that. And his love fills in those gaps. And, and he uses us. See, it doesn't matter what you've done or where you've been. It doesn't matter how you've failed or how you've succeeded in life. God, God can. He will use you if you allow him to. I guess the big question is, are you letting him?